Hello, curious listener. You have stumbled upon public health on duty. I am your host, Anjali, a master's in public health policy and management student and your resident outdoorsy public health advocate. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm Martha, pronouns she, her as well. I'm a public health professional and an LGBTQI plus health advocate, aka the defender of the gays. Yes. Public Health on Duty aims to inspire students and young professionals to enter the field by giving them a glimpse of the lives of public health practitioners, whether in the government, for-profit, non-profit, or in the academe. In this session, we're focusing on the talk of the town, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm, Yeah, but is it really the talk of the town? I mean, with two plus years into the pandemic, the virus sort of just assimilated into everyday life. That's true. And I think it would be interesting, though, to look back and at what has happened since this all started, knowing what we know now and all. Mm, Okay, that's interesting. So what we're trying to do really is get a glimpse of what it was like working in public health during the height of the pandemic and get anecdotes straight from the source. So we'll be inviting guests every episode to get the lowdown on public health, the biggest crossover event since Marvel's Endgame. But just a disclaimer though, what we talk about today may not necessarily reflect the situation in the future when this episode is released. What we will be giving you, though, is 100% true to our guests' experiences. So you'll still be getting the tea on what goes on behind the curtains in public health. Yes, and we'll do our best to update our show notes in the episode description if there are any changes, emerging science, fun facts, and other good juicy stuff. So please do check it out. Okay, so let's get on with the episode. Um, we're here today with two lovely ladies, Attorney Faith Laperal and Attorney Geneve Masahud. Welcome to Public Health on Duty. Yay! Would you like to introduce a little bit of yourselves? So maybe tell us your pronouns also. Faith, why don't you start? Okay, um, so I'm Faith. Pronouns are she and her. Um, I have a degree in political science and uh, Jura's doctor degree from UP. Um, how I found myself in public health, I actually stumbled upon public health because I was such a grammar Nazi. So I had <laughs> this friend who was working in the DOH and he kept asking me to proofread and revise the speeches he's been doing for work. Um, and so when there was an opening, um, since I've been doing it with such passion to correct other people, <laughs> um, he asked me to apply and that's uh, how I first came into the DOH. I got the job and I had I stayed for over a year, but I had to leave because um, law school wouldn't let me go on. I needed to um, fi- uh, complete this internship. And then after which I found myself getting some health projects on the side. So I did work for the IRR of the Reproductive Health Bill and... Mm. Um, also some manuals and learning materials for healthcare workers for procurement of health commodities. And then after I found myself in the uh, pub- private sector, health- relatively health-related um, work in the water sector. Mm-hmm. After that, well, I just found myself back to the DOH in 2018. <laughs> How about you, Jimmy? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, so I'm Geneve. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I took up social sciences in UP Manila and worked for a multinational company prior to law school. After that, I went straight to government, uh, working in Comelec before I joined uh, Secretary Duque's team in GSIS. Now, seven months in, Chairman Duque was appointed back to DOH and I was assigned to the office of the chairman in PhilHealth. I think the only connection that I have in public health when I started was... Um, Back in college, my thesis was based on the migration of nurses, specifically mm-hmm. in the Southeast Asia. And it has somewhat come to a full circle when I was um, immersed in, pub- it, specifically in health financing when I was in PhilHealth. Oh, okay. So parang kailang tumbling din kayo before you stumbled into public health. But what is it like? Being a lawyer inside public health, it's not really common that you hear of yeah. lawyers in public health. 
Mm, well, when I came into the DOH, I've already experienced working for two other government agencies. And one of the first things I've noticed was really there aren't enough lawyers in DOH. <laughs> so there was a scarcity of lawyers because in the other government agencies, you'd have like a lawyer in almost every office. Well, right. because it's still government administration. You still do issuances, etc. And so it was such a shock that there was such scarcity of lawyers in the DOH. See, when I started with Secretary Dupe, I thought that they didn't really need lawyers. I figured that, pwede naman tayo mag-Tagalog, di ba? Yeah. yeah. Nisi ko na gagawin ko lang, mag-review ng contracts, ng mga kaso, at ipo-proofread. Right. Uh, but on the first day, I realized now with the policies that were being uh, presented for approval by our decision makers, there was, a, there was really a need for for legal eyes to ensure that all the policies that that our agency would would approve would meet uh, the necessary legal requirements and would be able to stand on itself when its uh, when its constitutionality will be questioned in the proper courts. So um, aside from the legal hats that you were wearing when you entered the DOH, so you, you also came to realize na. Part of the job is also um, looking into the technical soundness of the policies that are written by the DOH. So aside from Ibabangasha with health sector priorities, the Universal Health Care Act. So also looking into how our priorities fit no, um, with the directions of other laws as well. Mm. Yeah, actually, and aside from the technical hat, the two of you actually were essentially managers of the organization as well. I mean, I guess full disclosure, you you two were our bosses. Yeah. <laughs> well, since the first season is all about COVID, and the next set of questions will be kind of like reminiscing what happened when the COVID <laughs> the horrors of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Do we really want to go there? <laughs> We're going to take a trip down memory lane. Um, so both of you have been in the office of the secretary since Secretary Dupe assumed in 2017. Fast forward to 2020 when the pandemic was declared and the first case in the country was detected. What were like the significant changes in the organizational structure of the DOH and PhilHealth that took place to equip both agencies in handling the pandemic? Um, let me just correct that. It's actually Geneve who joined the secretary since the beginning. So I just came in sometime in 2018. But when the pandemic started, so I had like a little over a year in the Department of Health already. Um, the changes, I guess, well, if I recall it correctly, um, at the start of the pandemic, it really entailed a lot of coordination. Yeah. So the if the first case was actually... Uh, foreign national. So you needed to coordinate with the embassies. Right. And then at the beginning, we didn't have testing capacity for COVID. So the samples were, you needed to coordinate with Australia because the samples were taken to the laboratory in Victoria. So they did, they did the testing for us. So before our ITM was even capacitated. So that's one thing, um, coordination with the different agencies. Um, and then, I guess one of the first things organizationally, since I think that's what you wanted to also hear from us, is um, there was an em uh, emergency operation center following, you know, how they proceed with outbreaks, etc., um, that was created in the Department of Health. And it was headed by the Undersecretary for the Public Health Services team, um, then Undersecretary Mirna Kabotahe. Um, and so that team uh, was, you know, specifically mandated to really coordinate the response in terms of information, handling the resources, and then doing the communication. So they, they did that. Um, and then right now, the IATF is a household name. But before the pandemic, there we didn't know what the IATF is. Um, it was actually the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases. It is under an executive order issued way back in 2014. And um, before the pandemic, it wasn't even convened. But they just maintained a small technical working group of um, technical staff that coordinated, well, 
not very tightly with the DOH, but they, but they, you know, see each other from time to time. So the COVID-19 pandemic really prompted uh, the convening of the IATF. So we had to do that like from scratch. There was no secretariat. We were the ones doing the secretariat to work before the uh, before the formal secretariat was um, designated. And so, um, and then back then, it was just a group of like eight agencies, like eight departments. But, you know, when the con- pandemic happened, it wasn't realistic enough to have just eight agencies because you realize that it entailed a lot of work. And so by the time we left, it was more than 30 agencies sitting in the IATF. So there, um, it was a mix of, you know, looking for like having a team to really focus on COVID pandemic work, uh, pandemic response work, I mean, and then looking for what existing structures or what existing mandates we can check um, so that we don't have to replicate things. Um, I guess that's what but what happened in the DOH side. And well, it's not just the DOH side anymore because it's actually like the whole of government being mm-hmm. tapped to assist in the pandemic response. Yeah. Um, process-wise, uh, the the 2020, um, it spelled the, well, it paved the way for the use, of, full use of digital platforms. Diba sa DOH, very particular sila sa transport uh Sending documents in hard copies, right. but with the with the restrictions brought about by the quarantine, we were all forced to go digital, including communications. So, like with the pandemic, that means the organization really had to adapt different tools and skills actually to be able to respond quickly. So, I guess maybe that kind of brings us to the next question that. Um, what other things aside from the use of digital tools you think kind of help make the organization more efficient when it comes to decision making? <laughs> um, so because I've mentioned earlier the IATF, it was meant to be a policy making body at like a higher level, but you needed like um, entities to execute. And so it, it couldn't just be DOH alone because the pandemic actually shifted a lot of work towards DOH. You have the technical policy making, um, you know, even if other agencies are procuring for us, we do the technical specs. So uh, like the heavy lifting really fell to the DOH. And so we needed other other agencies to help. And so one of the most efficient, well, the most efficient ways that it was done uh, was to tap the agency responsible for disaster response, the NDRRMC. And so um, it actually uh, devolved the decision making at the implementation level. And it, it was also, it was that because it had an existing structure already when we have typhoons, when you have disasters. It has presence in the regions, in the localities. Um, and so that actually helped with, you know, quick decision making at the ground level. Um, I guess that that did it. And then the interface, it, you know, government did, the different government secretaries would usually just meet in the cabinet meetings. But, you know, because of the pandemic, uh, the IADF for a while even met like twice or more than twice a week. And so it was like the first time that the secretaries were actually sitting together, well, in one Zoom room, not one room. Um, but yeah, it, it actually facilitated coordination like in such an, I don't know. <laughs> it's like it's like the first yes, in an unprecedented manner. It was the first time that you were actually we were actually you know conversing with different directors from like different offices from the Bureau of Immigration. We were talking to people from the Dole at a very regular basis. You know, people we don't usually get to talk to. You we were talking to people from the OPAP, from the OCD, from PNP, like left and right, different agencies. So I guess. It was really the necessity of the times that allowed that, but it was like such, I don't know, such, I don't know how to describe it, but it was the first time that that happened, that level of coordination between government agencies. And that really facilitated, you know, decision making at the levels of the different departments. But to add to that, um, prior to the pandemic, we were used to uh, getting directives from other organizations, from, from the Office of the President. 
after, say, a decision was made in an executive uh, meeting, writing it down into a, a, a resolution or a, des- or a decision took time and time to publish it to make it effective. But with when the IATF was organized and with the necessity to put out decisions at such an unprecedented level, it was, um, we saw organizations commenting on the same document allow, in the same digital platform. Right. That, and it was finished in a few hours. That was published in the official gazette a few hours later. And then uh, it will be communicated to the public by the, the official spokesperson or the, or the presidential spokesperson. So the, the decision making process and putting into effect these decisions yeah. became quite, uh, we weren't used to it. Parang kaya pala yeah. na ganun ka no, right. to get things done. I guess that was the lesson. Na parang everything like was war- on warp speed. So, balik ko lang no, there was an interesting insight from Athene Faith earlier na you also valued people no who took the initiative and took the accountability so that decisions were made faster than before how did the organization also made sure no that the DOH is still headed in the right direction it's so general <laughs> the right <laughs> direction well i think uh, during covid the covid-19 pandemic okay. since uh, we had uh, two of our EAs actually review the policies like for to check for <clears throat> consistencies and one of those was, uh, one of them was Ange. And then, the other, <laughs> and then the other is Rod. And so they, they really tried to make sure that their policies are consistent because, you know, it, well, it, people would think it's a matter of common sense, but, you know, you get lost in a lot of like technical jargon and all that. And so, and then sometimes, I guess, at the high level, common sense is like oxygen. So the higher you go, sometimes the thinner it gets. <laughs> <laughs> no, but parang it's a mean din talaga. At uh, you know, parang because of the adrenaline and all that, and needed to uh, decide as fast as you can. Sometimes yung mga little things lang parang biglang in the same policies, parang paragraph A will uh, be so inconsistent with paragraph B, or parang sobrang contradictory ganun. And so we just needed like people to check. Yeah, I guess as somebody who was in charge of reviewing the policies. I understand where technical offices come from. Like when we devolve decision-making, sometimes they get to really minute details that a, a lot of executive office don't actually get to see or experience. So that that adds a lot of value to the policies that we put out or the programs that we do. But then also being in the office of the secretary, we also had the benefit of like seeing the top-down view, being able to sit down with the Execom and really understand the strategic di- directives or the goals. So that helps us ground also and kind of balance it out. When we receive policies or when we get like documents, like we have to be able to both like get the technical and minute details, but then make sure that it still heads and fu- funnels towards that strategic directive. Once something kind of falls out of that strategic directive, then that becomes a way, a, like a, an opportunity for us to align and tighten things up even more. Right. Yes, I think also uh, one of the nicer things that we get to we got to experience in Osa because that's Andrew was saying we are able to connect the policy with the operations because it we're the same office that these technical offices are are coordinating with. So when I, I recall in PhilHealth, um, when we were putting out the COVID packages, iba yung intindi ng central office on the policy side. That was when it was implemented in the regional offices, when a patient or a hospital would claim the benefit packages. Magkaiba yung, pagkaka- magkaiba yung intindi. And because we were part of the team that were uh, present during its deliberation and this, and approval, we were able to bridge in the gaps. So we've been talking a lot about COVID, 
But at the end of the day, of course, the health sector's priority is achieving universal health care. With all that's happening, how did the DOH make sure that UHC is not derailed while everyone is busy responding to COVID? Mm-hmm. I think some of the things you needed, Sana, or which should have been established through UHC, badly needed uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, the DOH, by responding to the pandemic, actually accelerated some of the reforms um, under UHC. So you have, for example, your one hospital command. It's a patient and navigation referral um, system. And you are we're, we're looking to having that institutionalized as a national patient navigation and referral uh, center. So hopefully that bill gets passed. And then, of course, you're able to invest heavily on our hospitals. Um, we, A lot of our hospitals, uh, we've been able to procure and receive a lot of donations for medical equipment, laboratory equipment. We have a lot of um, ventilators, x-rays coming in. So that helped us, you know, improve our treatment, uh, treatment capacities. And then um, our laboratories. Not all regions have RT-PCR laboratories, but I guess the pandemic was able to really push that agenda. Um, what else? Uh, the pandemic allowed the local governments to own up to their mandate because basic health services are really um, un- supposed Duties to be provided the by the local yeah. government under the local government code. Um, it's just that for the longest time, there was really heavy reliance on the DOH to provide these services. And so uh, during the pandemic, you would have your city health officers, your BHERTs, the what's BHERTs? Yeah. Brenda, health, health emergency, emergency response, response teams. teams. So um, it's really like how the LGUs uh, took charge. And I guess that's one of the best things that happened in the pandemic. You now realize that your first line uh, for these matters are you, the LGUs. Totoo yan. Kasi in the first, uh, first few months of 2020, we realized how how LGUs, how local government units needed, badly needed support. But you'd also see the opportunities that were missed. So we learned na yung um, ESU, Epidemiolo- yes, Epidemiology so, Surveillance Unit, unit. Sala, which, is lodged in, which are lodged in, with the LGUs, were heavily undermanned. Or um, If they even exist at all. Exactly. Because they relied on the national government to do the contact tracing. So when when the spotlight was shown on these gaps, it became inc- incumbent upon these um, these local chief executives to ensure that the right talents are recruited and are developed and are compensated to ensure that the Siling foot soldiers, they're the first line of defense. Um, so we want to make sure that when th- should a next pandemic happen or should this pandemic Make us suffer for a few more, for a few more months. <laughs> the 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 right foot soldiers are there for us. Mm-hmm. As lawyers, as managers, what are certain skills you feel are particularly important to bring in or to cultivate in your field? As lawyers in public health? Yes. Yes. Um, so I guess for me, the most essential thing is really the public health perspective. Um, as lawyers, you're actually, you know, legal knowledge is somewhat standard. And so you get a package of it from law school, legal reasoning, research and how to interpret laws, etc. But um, the the laws aren't always complete. And so what you do uh, with, the, with the gaps, there will always be gaps to fill. And what you do with that always depends on the perspective you have. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's not just, it's not just being legalistic because you can get a lot of, uh, you can do a lot of things conflicting with um, public health when you start to be very legalistic. Uh, You know, when you're lawyers, your concept of rights are actually very individual. So, but an appreciation of public health will allow you to look at things uh, with a perspective to what is the common good, what is, you know, the rights of others as opposed to your rights. I guess that's more important to me than, you know, any legal, legal skill. Kasi parang sayang yung legal skills mo if 
you don't have the public health perspective. Um, for example, lang, parang, uh, at a personal level, you do have like your right to smoke. But how does it affect <laughs> other people's rights <laughs> to clean it? Or no, you have, uh, yeah. yeah. oh, you have, the, you, you have hmm. to wear you have the right not to wear, wear a mask. mask yeah. But how does that affect like the safety and the health of the people around you or people who would just like by chance happen to be near you? So, so I guess that kind of perspective is something not inherent to law or to a legal perspective because that has been one of. Like the challenges I've had with working with lawyers during this pandemic, and um, so which brings us to the next question, no? And we've been talking a lot about how public health and law is converging. Um, siguro parang how important naman is law to public health? Mm, I guess it's super important because health is the business of government. And the government does things, acts um, through issue directives, through laws, etc. So parang the new main convergence for me. As I mentioned earlier, diba, parang I was so shocked na halos walang lawyers in um the DOH. So parang nakukulangan pa rin ang kulangan pa rin ako din sa number of lawyers in the health sector. And then, um, I guess, when you talk about ano kasi, law in the context of public health, I think the first things that go to mind would be regulation, like yung um, regulation of uh, health commodities through FDA, the medicines, and in our hospitals through the HFSRB. Um, but, and then of course there's the other segment of like lawyers who think now going to DOH is just you know another administrative agency mm-hmm. so ma legal support uh, for the day to day procurement the, the, the usual things that they have Admin to services uh, uh, contend with um, but I guess there's more for lawyers in public health. I mean, regulation will be a big part of it, but also there is advocacy. I mean, right. how can you um, create and promote um, helpful behaviors? Um, how you can finance health services as well? Geneva has been trying to do uh, in PhilHealth and then how you integrate uh, systems within LGUs, like since we're pursuing universal health care. And so... There are skills that you can get like from private practice or from other government agencies because how you'll implement it will actually also still be through the usual things naman adapted just for health. So if you're an expert in joint ventures and PPPs, then you know, it's just really doing that for uh, hospitals or for the integrated health sys- or networks in the cities or provincial uh, LGUs that are undergoing UHC um, or if you are into labor then maybe human resources then you can also you know de- help develop plans as to how to improve the sector that the healthcare workers in general so it's inescapable <laughs> though will very be important for it to pick up from there the most important thing I think we need to ask is why do you think future lawyers should join public health? Or maybe advice na lang for those who want to join public health. Uh, why don't start? So, what about topic? Um, advice for uh, those who want to join public health. Maybe if they're still if they are still law students, then they just have to you know stick with the basics because you don't get to public health law as a lawyer if you're not a lawyer first. So. Um, whatever you learn uh, from from law school, um, this will be your weapons when you go out of it and you choose to pursue whatever track you want. Um, advice also is um, that, you know, law is a force for good. And so um, public health is actually, you know, a track which seeks the good for your community, good for your country. And so I think it's easy. Uh, it's an easy path to choose, but a difficult one to walk on or tread on. So, and then if you're up to the challenge or you actually crave 
a challenging life, um, then maybe go to public health. Or... It's also fulfilling, surprisingly. Because <laughs> 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 most of in, in my batch, ako lang ang kilala ko nasa ano nasa public health sector. Uh, most are in most are doing litigation or in the corporate sector. Uh, but it's when when we when we do reunions, kasi and I explain why DOH uh, put out this particular policy. And, and they would always tell me, you're starting to sound like a doctor. But maybe that's, uh, if, if I can be an instrument to bridge the gap in helping understand the technique, the many technical jargons of, you know, of, of public health, uh, that's, that's something I look forward to and I find fulfilling and satisfying. And um, I, I know that now, um, my cup, I need to empty my cup. So, with uh, with the post DOH fill, slash fill health uh, tasks that we're doing now, um, it I hope that that would help enrich me and my experiences. So when I return to the public health sector, which I plan to do, uh, it would I would be uh, in a better position to push forward the agenda of universal health care. Okay, what we learned today was that law is a tool for good. <laughs> and if you're a f- and if you're a future lawyer who is passionate in helping people and making sure that they're healthy, you can't be a smoker. Go to public health. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us here at PhD Attorney Faith and Attorney Jen. I mean, your rich experience in public health and public service hopefully inspires more lawyers to take the plunge. And if there are listeners out there looking for a sign, this is it. Now, before we end, we'll have our final segment we'd like to call the JQW Book Club. Each episode will give everyone book recommendations from Dr. John Q. Wong, our senior technical advisor and the founder of Epimetrics, Inc., Yes. So if you have ever met Doc Wong, you know that he is essentially a walking library casually dropping you book recommendations about every single topic you can think of. So we've gathered recommendations related to our episode straight from Dr. Wong himself. This episode, Dr. Wong recommends The Cleveland Clinic Way. Lessons in excellence from one of the world's leading healthcare organizations by Toby Cosgrove. So he is the president and CEO of Cleveland Clinic. So you'll be learning straight from a top executive what they did to innovate and revolutionize healthcare in their system of hospitals and clinics. Dr. Cosgrove is a leader in the movement toward large group practices, collaboration, use of big data, innovation, better patient experience, wellness and integrated care, and personalized medicine. So in the face of a crossroad between expanding healthcare or providing intimate, personalized care, this book points to how you might be able to do both. And since we're on the topic of innovative and value-driven healthcare, Dr. Wong gave us another great read. Prescription for the Future, the 12 Transformational Practices of Highly Effective Medical Organizations by Ezekiel J. Emanuel. Dr. Emanuel was a special advisor for health policy during the Obama administration and helped draft the Affordable Care Act. So he knows all about making large-scale transformations. We're not going to spoil what those 12 things are just yet, but this book sees the long-standing American public health conundrum as an opportunity for reform at fundamental and structural levels to bring affordable and quality care. Lastly, in honor of our guests who are both lawyers, Doc Wong also recommends Public Health Law, Power, Duty, Restraint by Lawrence O. Gostin. Like Attorney Faith said, Law is supposed to be a tool for good. So how can we use it to protect the health of the people? This book has great examples of how these two fields intertwine in various scientific, political, and ethical issues such as tobacco, food and beverages, alcohol, firearms, prescription drugs, and marijuana. Thanks for listening to this episode of Public Health on Duty. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, 
YouTube, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Public Health on Duty is a joint production between Epimetrics Inc. and Big Baby Studios. Dr. John Q. Wong is our executive producer. Editing and hosting by Anjali Magdaraog and Martha De La Paz. Our producers are Abigail Tan and Antoinette Mendoza. Sound engineering and original theme music by PV Nicholas. You can find out more about Epimetrics at www.epimetrics.com.ph or at EpimetricsPH on Facebook and Instagram. This has been Martha. You can find me on Instagram at underscore call me Martha. And I'm Anjali. I am not on social media, but you can catch Martha and me on the next episode of Public Health on Duty.